as a physician and psychiatrist, she's worked in the UK National Health Service for many years, uh, became the lead clinician for psychotherapy in Hertfordshire. And Sue currently teaches at the Tavistock Institute and at the Portman, uh, Portman National Health Services Foundation Trust in London. And she's a consultant for our psychotherapeutic consultation service for physicians. Um, interestingly, she's married to Tom Stewart Smith, who many of you know is a celebrated garden designer. And over the past 30 or more years, the two of them have created a, a very beautiful and internationally known barn garden in Hertfordshire. And part of that property, that large property, is now used by a local charity to provide horticultural training for people with learning disabilities. And the, the focus of um, Dr. Stuart Smith's talk today will be around her book, The Well-Gardened Mind, that's subtitled Rediscovering Nature in, in, in the Modern World. And this is an extraordinarily well-written and very complex book that looks at the relationship between gardening and nature and mental, and mental health. And uh, the book has really taken off as a phenomenon in both the UK and the US. It was a Sunday Times bestseller in the UK. It was listed as one of the best books of 2020 by the London Times. And it was the gardening book of the year by the Sunday Times. So for those of you not familiar with it, it's really well written and insightful. And there, she very skillfully weaves together neuroscience and psychoanalysis and as well as being a terrific storyteller, books about her family and uh, patients that she's looked after. So just a few quotes. The book investigates the magic that many gardeners have known for years. Working with nature can radically transform our health, well-being, and confidence. Dr. Stuart Smith tells brilliant, illuminating stories of people struggling with stress, depression, trauma, and addiction, from asylum seekers to veterans, inner city young people to the retired. So close quote. So Sue also talks a lot about the beneficial effects of gardening and horticultural therapy in psychiatric patients, in prisoners, and in, in others. So if you ever wanted to understand why gardening can be so extraordinarily satisfying and therapeutic, and how a garden is not just a physical space, but also a mental space, and gardening is both a physical and a psychological activity, uh, this book really kind of pulls all of those themes together. And, and teaches an enormous amount. And just to switch tracks for a second, as most of you know, the IOL is on 35 acres of land that was landscaped by Frederick Law Olmsted, who was America's outstanding landscape architect of the 19th century. And he designed New York Central Park and Prospect Park in Brooklyn and the Capitol Grounds and the Emerald Necklace in Boston. And um, Importantly, Umstead himself, just like Dr. Stuart Smith, believed very deeply in the restorative power of landscapes that recalled the beauty of nature. So there's a, a consistency there. Uh, also at IOL, we have a productive greenhouse, and Mike Matthews, uh, in a former incarnation, directed a really successful horticulture therapy program here at IOL. So I really wanted to give a shout out to that. And finally, there's a sizable group of us dedicated gardeners and master gardeners among the IOL professional staff here. So Dr. Stuart Smith will be reassured of a very, of a very receptive audience. Uh, so Sue, I'll hand things over to you at this point. We're really, really looking forward to your talk today. So welcome. Thank you so much, Godfrey. That was a really, really lovely introduction. And, and thank you for your kind words about the book. Um, and actually also wonderful to, to know a little bit more about where you're situated and the, and the landscape around you. Um, and, and Olmsted, of course, features in, 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 my, in my book in the, in the chapter on bringing nature to the cities. And, yeah, I think he, he was, you know, looking back now through history, he, he was so prescient, wasn't he, in observing the need for nature, particularly amongst, you know, the city workers and the... And the and the and the more deprived city residents who couldn't leave the city to appreciate the the, the wild. So I'm going to just try and um, share my screen because uh, all these themes will be will be coming up in my talk. Um, I just need to, I think, do that. Let's see if this works. Share my screen. Um, Uh, 
Gotcha. Uh, Rob, is there any way we can help with that? It should be coming it up now. It should be coming through. It tells, me, it tells me it's airing. I've got the... Well, we've seen these, so I'll skip over these. Yeah, there's a bit okay. of a delay in the UK and here as well. So okay. That's the thing. Okay. So now you should be seeing a slide of seeds. Seedlings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Godfrey, you were talking about your your seeds and, 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 and uh, you know, anticipating your seeds. So I thought I wanted to start, you know, we're all looking forward to spring. Um, and this was a, this was a focus in, in my, in my greenhouse, the greenhouse I share with Tom uh, last spring at the start of the pandemic. And I think it's worth also reflecting on, you know, when I, when I was researching the book, which actually took me five, um, you know, I had, I had various kinds of, social issues and crises in mind you know the gr the growing levels of anxiety and depression for example um the growing disconnect to nature and you know the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis but pretty much you know as the book came out we were plunged into a global crisis the pandemic and in the northern hemisphere this I think fortunately for us coincided with spring because it did give many people who who had access to to gardens or or or, or parks around them it, it gave us a part of life that that was un, that was that was renewing that, that you know, symbolized hope as it were um and 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 you know whilst the human world was being put on hold and uh, you know weddings were being cancelled um, you know, holidays were cancelled. Um, life became very uh, fearful and 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 uh, uncertain. Uh, the the natural world, the cycle of the seasons, was unchanged, and that that had a very helpful, stabilising effect for many many people. And and it's an effect that actually people have drawn on across the ages. At, at, you know, following great traumas you know, emerging from depression and so on, this aspect of the natural world, the sense of its transience on the one hand, its ever-changing qualities, but its, its continuity is, is, very, um, is very sustaining to us psychologically. And I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the state that we were all plunged in at that point, and there, were, there was a run on seeds in the UK, and as far as I understand it, in the US as well. Uh, that, um, you know, the, the garden centres really couldn't keep up with the demand because gardening is something that, um, that gives us a, a little bit of a sense of a future. You know, times when the trees are closed for various reasons, um, and that may be through um, mental health issues or, as, as we were, this collective crisis. Sowing seeds and cultivating the earth means you are immediately anticipating something good to come in the next few months. It helps, it shifts, it shifts the mind towards, towards the future in a way that can be very, very helpful. And I'm just going to show you one slide of our veg my vegetable garden, actually, because it is the part of the garden. So this was a few, um, probably eight weeks later, some of those some of those seedlings in the ground, along with quite a lot of self-seeded flowers. Um, part of my pleasure in gardening is is what I call a give and take relationship with nature. So I I like to I like to see what the you know what the nasturtiums do and the poppies do and the schultzia does and the verbena where it pops up in the garden and I leave as much of it as I can without it interfering with the with the productivity of the garden. And of course, you know, it has to be said that everything in the garden isn't always rosy and and green. You know, um, there are times when things don't grow, when the pests destroy your your precious uh, plants. Um, so there's also something important, though, in that, which is um, a, learning, just learning to overcome small setbacks, uh, developing a kind of persistence. You know, it's been said, uh, gardeners, th there's defiance. Uh, for, yeah, gardener expresses defiance, if you like. 
um, and and then you know when you when you see the outcome of your, of your efforts and 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 the fact that we we are working we're harnessing nature's creativity you know is it coming together in a garden of human creativity on the one hand and nature's creativity um and 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 that in itself is empowering i'm going to show you one one more slide uh from our garden this is taken on the edge of our garden um, it's uh, in summer. It's a wild flower meadow. You can see it here in in spring with all the daffodils. Um, we haven't quite reached that point of the year yet. This this was taken last year, um, and 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 you know I think this this image of green and a new life uh, is is something that, that that as I mentioned earlier, people were able to draw on last spring. Now, there's a, a phenomenon that's been called urgent biophilia. The, the socio-ecologist Keith Tidball um, coined that phrase, drawing on E.O. Wilson, e. Wilson's concept of biophilia, our innate love of nature. And what, what um, Tidball has observed through working in disaster zones around the world, uh, war zones and... Um, uh, following natural disasters and so on is is the is the extraordinary um regularity with which he sees people are drawn in order to recover and rebuild their lives drawn to working with nature to reconnect with the land um Tidwell's, he's actually written a very good book called greening in the red zone which which um sets out there's a chapter devoted to to different different parts of the world where uh and he describes uh projects and so on like that and it, all of this is in a bibliography that i've sent to vanessa and i'll also send to to godfrey if you're interested in learning more and also of course there's a very big bibliography in the book itself so while we're looking at green nature i'm going to say a little bit about um the, the physiological effects of, of, of the natural world and connection with the natural world on us. So the, some, of the, some of the most important research in this was, was really pioneered by a man called Roger Ulrich, um, who uh, until quite recently was, was a professor at um, Texas A&M University. He's now gone back to, to Sweden. Um, but really, from the late eighties onwards, he he made this his field of study, um, and and he he's shown that and 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 it has to be said his his experiments have been uh, repped by others many many times. But what his work shows is that simply looking at a scene like this, um, as well as having you know direct contact with 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 let's say green nature in a park not only reduces anxiety and improves mood, but it, re it, it reduces blood pressure and heart rate. And these, these effects can be actually monitored within minutes. They're, they're very rapid. There's a sort of readjustment of our autonomic nervous system. Um, and, and following shortly on from that, about 20 to 30 minutes, uh, there's a reduction in stress in, in levels of the stress hormone, salivary cortisol. The other, the other important effect of green nature is its um, effects on our cognitive functioning. So that, that, so that again, uh, these are experiments carried out by Stephen and Rachel Kaplan, many of them in the 90s. Um, and what they found was that actually green, green scenery green vegetation helps us shift to a more uh, relaxed mode of attention. Um, so most of our working lives are spent on task-focused attention. Um, and, and actually, the brain evolved, you know, as a hunter-gatherer brain,
um, to really be only doing those kind of activities, maybe tool making or something, something that required close focus, S only some of the time. The rest of the time, our remote forebears would have been out in the landscape, h gathering food, looking for looking for prey, maybe. Um, but but in doing that they would be engaging a much more um, diffuse focused attention, which, which, and it is the balance between these that is restorative. Um, and there's also a suggestion that the, that the, that the, the balance between the hemispheres is, is um, eventually uh, restored as well, because you know, when, we, when we engage in a lot of activities uh, that are linguistic um, and, as I said, task-focused, this is this is very much sort of left hemisphere functioning. The other thing I think I want to mention quickly while we, while we've got while we're thinking about the the physiological research and the and the um, uh, and the effects of nature is is also the effects of soil bacteria um, because uh, you know we 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 live in very artificial surroundings. And, and increasingly, it's recognised that, that the depletion of, of the human microbiome is playing a part in all, all, all sorts of illnesses and disorders. Um, you know, autoimmune disorders, inflammatory disorders, and so on. That, that this, this, is, this is playing a part. It's not necessarily causing, but certainly playing a part. And increasingly, a recognition that they play that 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 you know deplete, depleted or disordered microbiome in the gut, for example, is 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 implicated in some cases of anxiety and and depression, and certainly uh, quite a lot of serotonin in, in health in states of health is produced in the gut. Now, when when we when we actually garden, um, we we get. We, we stir up the soil, we get into contact with the soil. Um, and uh, gardeners have been shown in one research study, that actually it was carried out in Australia, to have, ha to have a more varied um, and therefore more healthy gut biome. There's, there's a lot of interest in one bacteria in the soil um, in particular called Mycobacterium vacci. And Christopher Lowry's team... Um, have 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 much into this, and and their experiments, which are are, are, are mostly carried out on mice, um, have have shown that that exposure to these bacteria, which it's thought we can breathe in uh, when we when we got, um, help boost uh, levels of serotonin in the brain. And Larry's team are currently researching. Uh, the Mycobacterium vacci uh, as a potential for a treatment for for post traumatic stress. Now I'm going to introduce my grandfather Ted May um, because he he played a large part in in I suppose you know we take in our family histories, don't we? We take in all sorts of unconscious beliefs with that. And um, he played, I think, a large part uh, in my motivation for writing the book, but also my my connection with with gardening. So I grew up hearing from my mother that how, as a young man, Ted had been captured uh, in the run up to the Gallipoli invasion, the beginning of the early in the First World War. Um, off a submarine and and had spent the rest of the war as a as a prisoner of war, working in a series of of, of really brutal labour camps, and he was lucky to survive. He um, you know many of the prisoners didn't survive, and he 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 eventually reached home, but he was only six stone and very very malnourished, and in fact the the navy doctors thought he might well not survive for more than a few months because uh, there was certainly his heart that they, they thought at that time was damaged. My grandmother nursed him very lovingly. She'd waited for him and, and helped, you know, he regained some weight and he regained some of his strength. 
but his psychological traumas stayed with him. And then in 1920, in May 1920, he, he got the opportunity to, uh, to embark on a year-long course of horticulture. It was a, a rehabilitation course that had been set up, one of many, actually, that had been set up by the British government. Um, and I, I, I wanted to find out where that was, because uh, uh, nobody knew, nobody in the family knew. And, and I traced it, and I found it was on the shores of the Hamble River, which is near Southampton on the south coast in England, and really a rather large estate, English estate, which had been uh, an American hospital during the First World War. Uh, in fact, it was the largest hospital, largest American hospital in Europe. After the war, it was it was given back to, or sold back to the British government and and was used for 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 helping ex ex servicemen. And what I discovered about this place was that it it had not only a large walled garden as many English houses do or English country houses do, um, but it also had ten large glass houses many of which were heated. And, and I discovered from a letter uh, that was in, amongst my grandfather's papers that, it, you know, as well as learning to, to cultivate fruits and veg and so on, um, he had also cultivated melons and other, uh, uh, worked with the camellias in the camellia house and, and cultivated other exotics. And then I understood, really, so this photograph is him in his 60s, um, with his orchids, and as well as being very a very sort of self sufficient kind of gardener, you know he grew uh, grew lots of vegetables and kept bees and um, you know kept chickens and so on. Um, he he also had this love of growing orchids, and and he and he was known locally. You know he won various prizes for his orchids. And and I then sort of felt I understood that perhaps for him that was so important to recapture uh, something of that experience, which must have been very extraordinary, you know, to, to, to be in these wonderful glass houses full of light, full of camellias and palm trees and so on, after everything that he had been through. The First World War is in many ways the beginning of horticultural therapy, um, the discipline itself wasn't formally founded till after the Second World War, um, and, and Carl Menninger played played quite a large role in that. Um, but but actually, the roots I think come after the First World War, when so many wounded and traumatized men were returning home and needed respite from anything that was industrialized. It was, after all. The first, the first form of industrial warfare that people had experienced. And it wasn't only after the war. I'm going to say a little bit about during the war itself, because um, gardening featured right on the front lines in the, in the um, trenches of the Western Front. So this, this, is, this is a slide here taken... Um, uh, as, as soldiers from the Argyll and Sutherland, uh, Sutherland Highlanders. And as you can see, the garden is, is in fact, created on the back of the, uh, on the, back of the trench. Um, and, and, you know, this, if ever there's an example of urgent biophilia, this, this is certainly it, you know, that in, in a landscape of such death and destruction uh, and full of, full, of, full of anxiety and fear, as well as long, long periods of inaction, so quite a lot of boredom too. The soldiers wrote home and asked their relatives to send them packets of seed, which they did. And what they wanted was flower seeds. I mean, later on in the war, the soldiers started growing vegetables because food was also needed, and food was needed at the beginning, but really what they needed for psychological survival was beauty. Beauty and... and, and um, and familiar flowers, things that spoke to them of, of, of love and safety and home, that helped them ha hold on to a different reality from the one that they'd been plunged into. 
And in that way, these, these small acts of, of, of tending plants became a psychological lifeline for, for some of them. I'm going to just show one more. I, I love this slide um, because you can just see the attentiveness with which this, uh, this uh, soldier is watering his plants. Um, and, and I think it's a lovely image of care, actually, and how care, expressions of care, can, can, can transform uh, our experience of the world. When, we, when, when, when naturally we've been on the receiving end of, of the opposite. Um, one of the important things about care, which is hugely underestimated, uh, I think, in effects, is, is that it's, um, in terms of the brain and the functioning of the brain, it's, um, it's accompanied by uh, uh, an increase in uh, endogenous endorphins, our natural opioids. So care, care, the, care, the endorphin system is is our is fundamental. It's not only our pain relieving system; it's it's fundamental to our attachments, our human attachments, our attachments to our pets, and 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 this kind of attachment, attachment to, to anything that we're caring for and nurturing. And of course, care can be onerous. Care is not always rewarding and replenishing. But I think I think in the world that we currently live in, we've we've come to sort of see care as potentially more of a depleting activity, rather than rather than a replenishing one. Now this is a slide of a of a, a therapeutic garden in the English countryside outside Oxford. It's called Bridewell Organic Gardens. It's been running for over 20 years, very successfully. Uh, and, and as you can see, it's a walled garden. Um, uh, and these walled gardens like this are, are really an ideal uh, setting for, for a therapeutic garden. And I, what I like about this aerial view is, is it really allows you to see the different parts of the garden within that safe enclosure. You know, you've got the working parts of the garden, um, all the raised beds there in the, in, set out in lines. You've got the glass house and uh, the fruit cages. And then you've got, um, towards the top of the slide, you've got the, the, the more ornamental parts of the garden, which are kind of s s slightly secluded. They offer places where people can be alone if they need to be alone um, and simply be with nature, not be working in nature. Bridewell, Bridewell takes people as gardeners. Uh, um, they call them gardeners, not, not patients, um, who have long-term mental health problems, many of whom have had had repeated admittance hospital, um, and and what they do is they attend for two or three mornings a week, usually for about two years. And what their outcome shows that by the end of that time, for people who complete the program, um, that actually over sixty percent are are really have their lives on a different trajectory, which, given the chronicity of their problems, is is impressive. So so people will be. Uh, if not in employment, maybe part-time employment or volunteering or uh, will have embarked on higher education in some form or, or working in, on, on a community project in, in some way. Now, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, another project. Um, this, this slide was taken on a visit that I made to Alnarp, which is uh, a therapeutic uh, rehabilitation garden in Sweden, near Malmo. This, this garden was created 15 years ago by, uh, by the head of the department uh, there. Um, uh, he's a landscape architect called Patrick Gran. And Patrick Gran and his team have carried out 
a lot of research here which has been published um, in various journals around the world into, into the effects of gardening for mental health and actually also very interestingly looking at the kind of trajectory that, that patients have in going through, through a program, um, the different stages that they might go through. This program has a very different time frame. It's um, uh, the participants attend uh, every day for half a day, and they, they they come for twelve weeks. So it's a it's a series of twelve week programs. Uh, it's funded by the local councils, and it's aimed uh, at helping people get back to work. Um, many of whom are suffering from stress and burnout disorders. Um, who, you know, often are professionals or, um, and, and, they've, and they've not been helped by other interventions, by medication, by CBT, uh, and by, by all the sort of standard things that might be on offer. And, and they've usually been out of employment for about two years. And it's funded because it's a successful programme. Now, this corner of the garden... Uh, illustrates something very important about about Alnarp. Um, like Bridewell, it has a range of different uh, environments within it. So there, there's you know there's there's several large glass houses. There's vegetable plots. There's also on the edge some much wilder untended parts of the garden. And then there are these refuge areas in the garden. So you can see here the hammock. The, um, the pond in the foreground and the large stone. And, and at the beginning of the program, what, what the team here do, and it's a multidisciplinary team here, is a physiotherapist, psychotherapist, horticultural therapist, uh, and, and, and they all work in collaboration. What the team do is they ask the participants not, not to work in the garden at all, uh, but to simply find a space where they can be alone, where they want to be alone, and to reconnect. Uh, the, you know what they what they re, what the what Grant, Patrick Grant I recognised was the degree to which many of the people attending the project had really become disconnected from their bodies and from their senses, um, and 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 the, they were living in such a state of chronic stress. So this, this, this period, this sort of first couple of weeks in the programme is very much about quietening down and, and connecting with nature in that si very simple way. And in promoting that, they draw on the work of Harold Searles, who was an American psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. And he, Searles was writing in the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, and he was in many ways... a really ahead of his time because he was writing about you know ecology in a way that that seems now to be to be very very prescient um but what cells noticed in the in the um uh in the hospital that he worked at was how particularly at the beginning of an admission how for many patients actually their connection often with trees was a very important stabilizing factor um, that they would gaze at trees out of the windows, and and that this was this was this was actually a connection with with another form of life that was psychologically significant. What what he identified is that there are there are times for all of us really when human relationships are too complex and too demanding, and that we can be psychologically replenished by by having a break from that. But connecting, connecting with other forms of life, simpler forms of life, that don't make those same demands on us. So, for example, uh, well, actually, what Searles did is he he felt there was a hierarchy. So he had human relating at the top, which of course is our in terms of our social support networks, they are the most formative and important aspect of our lives. But then. But then below that, you've got animals, so people's relationships with pets, then, then trees, plants, and then stones and water. The, the unchanging nature of stones uh, and this sort of feeling of ancient time that comes from stones 
can be very important for people during during a during a major crisis that feeling of stability and and um yeah a connection to perhaps a deeper a deeper sense of time now i'm going to talk a little bit about sigmund freud um Freud, this this slide shows Freud in in his garden in Hampstead. He arrived in London uh, as a refugee um, shortly before the war, a year before the war broke out, and it was the last year of his life. So he arrived in 1938. Um, it was the first garden he'd ever owned, uh, although he was a great garden lover. So he he was diagnosed with cancer in the mouth uh, 16 years before he died. And having spent most of his youth and, and his sort of family days, a middle life, um, really escaping to the mountains as much as he could, he spent long, long summer holidays hiking in the Alps. Um, he was something of an amateur botanist. Uh, he taught his children to, to collect wild strawberries and to identify edible mushrooms and so on. He was a great nature lover, and it's not so. It's, not, it's an aspect of his life that's not so well known. But when his when he developed the cancer, his doctors forbade him to travel because he he experienced so many complications uh, following various sur surgical interventions he he had to have done. Um, so he, he took to, to renting a garden each summer in the suburbs of Vienna. And these, these villas that he rented all had large and, and, importantly, as far as he was concerned, they had to have a beautiful garden. Freud, I think, recognising what, what I was just talking about with Harold Searles, once, once said, um, flowers are restful to look at. They have neither emotions or conflicts. And and there's no, you know, he, he always had flowers. He was really a flower lover above all. He always had flowers in his consulting room. He also had this special bed constructed, and he brought it uh, over with him from Vienna when, you know, when he escaped. Um, it meant that he could spend as much time in the garden as possible. So he slept in the garden. He read out there he entertained visitors out there this 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 is taken in um in the garden in Hampstead uh where they where the gut where the bed was re-erected and 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 it's also a very nice example of something that, that's come called a threshold space um which increasingly is recognized to be very important for for uh patients recovering from illness, but also facing the end of life. So within the hospice movement, for example. So the need for a protected space that still allows you to, to experience, um, experience the beauty, to experience the natural world, to watch the birds or the, 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 the leaves rustling in, in the wind. This is one more slide taken in our in in the vegetable garden, uh, and um, it's uh, it's the delphiniums taken in in July, and um, it's you know for me it's one of the most beautiful experiences is when these come out. I'm going to do one more quote from Freud, where Freud was fascinated by beauty. Uh, and he he wrote um, well. He observed actually. He wrote um, that beauty has a curious, slightly intoxicating feel to it. And he also commented that although it can't prevent us from suffering, it can compensate for a great deal. And I was fascinated by this effect that he was writing about, um, having been several times, you know, in 
in various summers been really stopped in my tracks by by these flowers and by the by the by the by the beauty of their of, of their of that blue. I set off in in researching the 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 neuroscience of beauty, and I came across the work of uh, Semi Ezeki, who's based at University College in, and who sort of founded a whole new field of of neuro aesthetics. And in a series of of um, fMRI scans. He, he investigated the effects of, of, of beauty on them. And what he wanted to see is whether there was, a, if you like, a kind of signature for beauty, so that regardless of the, of the sensory modality, you know, whether it was um, beautiful music someone was listening to or looking at beautiful flowers like this or beautiful art, um, that regardless of the modality, was there, was there something that these experiences had in common? And he furthered the experiments, actually, to look at abstract beauty, mathematical beauty. He recruited some mathematicians into the second, the second of his um, uh, uh, research uh, scans. And what he found is that, indeed, there is, that the, the networks that are activated very reliably when someone subjectively describes that they are undergoing a beautiful experience... Um, Involve the the reward centers in the brain and the pleasure centers, and also all, all, all the circuits were were firing up in a way that um, you know the networks involved that was linked to romantic love, and these are all uh, also associated with, for example, um, neurotransmitters like dopamine, uh, serotonin and uh, the endorphin system as well, which is very strongly uh, uh, stimulated by beauty. So beauty can be a kind of medicine. I mean, you know, there are times when, when we can be too depressed or too preoccupied to take beauty in. But, but when, 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 we are, when it is accessible, um, it really can be. And, and, and Florence Nightingale noticed, noticed this in... in and wrote about this, uh, you know, during the Crimean War, the impact of flowers, for example, uh, that were brought onto the wards, uh, uh, and how, you know, the very wounded men who may have been despairing were kind of really turned round uh, by having flowers by their bed. Now, this is Donald Winnicott, who I'm sure many of you have heard of. He was a British paediatrician and, and psychoanalyst. And I draw on his, you know, the, the thinking that I've developed uh, about gardening and, and our relationship with the natural world and, and the therapeutics of it, I draw on his work quite strongly. Um, and, you know, what Winnicott investigated uh, was the, there's the importance of creativity to the human psyche uh, and the importance of play for children. And that human, crea you know, adult creativity as well is very much linked to, to childhood play, the kind of freedom we can experience and, and the sense of absorption in the task. And this, th these, these are qualities that, that, that many people find when they're gardening. They, they experience that sense of just losing themselves and, and in a way getting lost like a child in play. The, the other concept of, of Winnicott's that, that, uh, that is important is his notion of transitional space, the idea of the importance of the in-between. And, and I gardens really function in that way because on the one hand, um, we're, you know, we, can, we can escape for a bit, we can lose ourselves, you know, we, may be, we may be you know, dreaming or fantasizing about what we're, what we're creating, what we want to, what, what we want to, a little bit of paradise we want to kind of foster. Um, but at the same time, we're really in touch with all sorts of realities of life because, because the garden is, is, is where, you know, the earth, the soil, the plants, this is, this is the origin of life. This is where, what sustains life. Um, and also, there's no escaping that things die in the garden. You know, you're always working with the cycle of life. So you're simultaneously in touch with important realities. And this, this in-betweenness of the garden, this sort of transitional nature uh, of the experience, 
um, is also about a kind of physical in-between because the garden uh, is between the house and the outside world. It's not, it's not, you know, you can't um, equate it to either one or the other. It's its own special place. This is particularly important in healthcare. Um, so, so this this slide um, is a photograph taken of a of a garden, Salisbury General Hospital, in in the west of England. And you can see the hospital building in the background and the garden. What you can't see is the landscape beyond, uh, which is um, there's actually a car park beyond it, a big car park for people working and visiting the hospital, and then and then the hills, some rather beautiful hills that rise up beyond. So the garden here is is a is a very beautiful in between. Now this this garden was created by a charity uh, called Horatio's Gardens which since uh, 2012 has been creating gardens in spinal injury units in the UK. And they've just created uh, the fifth garden. Uh, there are actually 11 of these units in the UK. And, and until Horatio started doing their work, none of them had a garden. Uh, so they just created the fifth one, which was um, actually the husband, Tom. Uh, and um, you know, they, they're about to open another one. And uh, their plan is to try to, to raise enough money to create gardens in, in all of them. Because these patients are, are in hospital for a very long time. You know, they, they, they are undergoing uh, physiotherapy, rehabilitation and so on um, for, for, for months and months, maybe six to nine months. I'll show you one more picture from Horatio's. So... So yeah, here you can see one one of the patients I interviewed uh, when I visited um, was a young man who'd had a devastating injury uh, and was going to be wheelchair bound for the rest of his life. And what the garden really enabled in his case was um, was actually that his friends were willing to come and visit him. And, and I think equally he would have been em embarrassed or felt reluctant to, to expect them to come onto the ward um, and to really, you know, be so caught up in the inside of the hospital. Um, so, so the garden in this sense, what he said is it, it was a place where we, we, we all wanted to be. Um, and the value of the garden in that way is not, not to be underestimated in terms of giving respite from the real rigours of, of the treatment and, 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 and also all the emotional trauma that, that people have been through. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of other kinds of therapeutic gardening before I finish. Um, so the first is prison gardening. This, uh, this photograph was taken on Rikers Island which, as I'm sure, as many of you know, is the is the is the jail for for New York, um, and is really the penal colony. So there are a number of different jails on the island. I think there are about eleven or twelve, although it is in the process at the moment of being of being gradually closed. Uh, and the Horticultural Society of New York have been um, running a garden project there since since the mid 1980s. And, they, and, and in the last three or four years, that, that their work has really expanded. Um, and for a long time, they had two gardens. And now there are actually eight gardens in different, in different units within the jail. And I think that's testament to, to the results that, uh, that, 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 the, that, that are being seen. Um, I was really struck. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to visit and interview some of the participants. Uh, I was really struck by the power of gardening to uh, provide a way to someone who, who wants to change their life but cannot see how on earth they might do it and feels caught in, in a cycles of reoffending. that actually gardening uh, can actually... Uh, you know, really for the first time 
uh, give rise to that belief that change might be possible. And and one of the ways it does that is is giving very uh, is giving giving access to to an activity that is very you know, the, the results of it are very tangible. Um, whether it's the produce that can be shared, you know, the delicious tomato plants or the squash plants or the the kale or whatever, um, all the beautiful flowers. You know, there's an awful lot of shared pleasure in gardening. And, and, and actually very quickly, someone can feel proud of what they've done. And for people who've never felt proud, who've never been praised for anything they've done, gardening is a, is, can be a very, very empowering um, intervention, really. And, 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 you know, bring about a kind of self-belief that was lacking before. So the program that the Hort run um, is uh, has an extension in the community. So so uh, inside the jail, which is called the Greenhouse Project inside the jail, um, can sign up to be an intern with the green team in the community. Really vital to its success because yeah, that is that is the most vulnerable time when when somebody first comes out of jail. They're most vulnerable back into crime um, uh, the, the, the reoffending rates for Rikers are 60% so what that means is that uh, at, after three years 60% of people are back inside prisoners are back inside for those who complete the courts program that figure is as low as 10 to 15% so this is a very, uh, a very effective very worthwhile intervention No, I'm going to talk here. And I just, this is Hilda Crust, who's the director of the project. And I think, you know, I've been talking about the power of gardening and the effects deep and so on. Um, but one must not forget um, the, the role of the horticultural therapist, the programme organiser in all of this, and the skill that is needed to, to help people reach that point, you know, to, to re-engage where they're at, what they can deal with, you know, whether they need to work on their own or whether they can work with a group um, and, and sort of be able to sort of go at their pace but also keep, keep them moving on. So I'm just going to end by talking a little bit about community gardening and the, and the benefits of community gardening. Uh, and this, this, uh, this photograph is... Uh, uh, the building of a garden in in project, which is run by the International Rescue Committee and the New York Botanic Garden. Uh, it, uh, I'm going to show you uh, what it looks like more recently. So, so it's a project for refugees and and uh, immigrants living. As you can see, it's a very productive garden, uh, and it's um, got a little market in the corner. So it, it, people come into the garden from the community, and um, and it really exemplifies something that's been called gardening as a social bridge. John, for the future. I think that's right. Um, so, so, so it was uh, the effects of the farm. And I actually the most harmful effects of the farm are social. That there is a, a pro social effect, that somehow people are able to connect with each other in this unthreatening space. And again, you know, the garden, this in-betweenness of the garden is important.
Uh, hello again. The, this is Godfrey. We're trying to get Dr. Stuart Smith back online just to finish off her talk for those of you who are uh, still remaining, the 20 or so. Try and hang in there if you can, and uh, we'll see what we can do as far as AV. She's been cut off from the UK, so we're trying to restore that. Hey, Godfrey, Sue should be back in the meeting now. I see her popped up. Uh, yeah. Yes, I don't know what happened there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, yeah, if you want to. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, if you want to pick up where, you're le where you left off, we can do that. Well, I don't I don't know where I got cut off. I'd, I'm not sure either, <laughs> but we got you back now, so that's good. Um, I'm also aware of your time, so I hope I hope I wasn't because you know I I couldn't see anything wrong at this end at all. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, you know, all of a sudden everything just froze. So, and I was like, why why everything stopped? And so I'm like seeing all these people disconnect, and I honestly thought that you had reached the end. But um, yeah, no, I mean. Um, if you want to continue, that's that's up that's that's up to you. I don't know, Godfrey, if, how if you if you have any opinion well, on I think that. I don't because I don't know where I got I got cut off. I hope it was quite near the end, and I don't know whether you want. I know you wanted to have a little bit of a discussion and 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 chat time, so I'm happy to do that. Yeah, it looked like you were pretty much wrapping up. So, Rob, what, what one thing I'm not able to see is people's questions. Usually, I can see a little speaker thing, and that that's disappeared. Are you able to access okay. that? Yeah, no, I have I have the chat up and uh, up in front of me. Um, if anybody is still um, in the meeting and has any questions, um, if you move your mouse. Over to the left of your video, there's an arrow that says show side panel. Click on that. You'll see the participant list first come up. And then at the top, there's a little speech bubble that, that when you mouse over, it says events. Click on that. Yes. And then um, down at the bottom, there's an area for you to write your message. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to, to write them down there. Um, and then, um, Godfrey, if you want to just um read them off okay so there's there's nothing there currently but i i had a question actually for sue yeah please is, go and, read it least, exactly and in, in in the u.s there's this guerrilla gardens movement in urban settings oh, yeah. where people will uh sneak in at night and cultivate vacant lots or throw in seed bombs into yeah. inaccessible areas yeah. or start cultivating the median strips of roads for flower yeah, gardens yeah, or vegetables. Yeah. Is there anything equivalent in the UK to that? Absolutely, there is, yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I do write about both these in, in my book, but, um, but you know, I mean, uh, Ron Finley, for example, who's, who, who, who te set, you know, started tending the strips, the parkway in, in South LA. Um, but in the UK, yes, there, there's a movement that started called the Incredible Edible Movement. Um, which started in in the north of England, and and it was a group of right. uh, women in their fifties who kind of started started sowing sowing vegetable seeds and and runner beans in particular around the town uh, and 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 putting up signs saying to people to help themselves to it, and it really has taken off. I mean, it's become a very popular movement. I love it. 
Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, back in the 60s when I was in medical school, I, I lived in a commune and I was the gardener that was supposed to supply food to the house, which I did very inadequately. But um, <laughs> when I was tending Brussels sprouts, a, a band of motorcyclists came by and took off with a bunch of Brussels sprout plants that had just come to fruition. Oh, that, was... that sounds most, most <laughs> unlikely, doesn't it? I mean, what, what they yeah. say in Todmorden <laughs> is, by and large, nobody, nobody vandalizes the plants. People don't tend to steal them or take too much. You know, it seems to sort of bring about a sort of a fairness in some way. So, um, yeah. Yeah, this is, I guess, a counter example. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, it was really helpful to have such a, a nice overview of this very interesting and vast topic. So really, really want to thank you for, for doing this. No, well, I hoped I wanted to just rather than putting out, part, you know, bullet points, I thought it nice to have an immersive actually see that see the slides, um, you know, to experience, I think, something, particularly at this point in the year, in winter, you know, to, to really feel the effects of, um, of gardens and, and green, green nature and new growth and so on. Yeah, everything's so gloomy and bare right now. We really do need a touch of that. And yeah. um, many, many of the topics we talked about today are in, covered in much, much more depth in the book, so I really would encourage people to read it. It is um, several of us in, in the U.S., ordered the book from the UK before it was even available in the States. So we oh, got really? a dedicated That's amazing. Forum. <laughs> That's amazing to know that, yeah. Because actually they're they're slightly different editions. The the um the US book has doesn't have the colour colour plates in it. No, it has lots of black and white illustrations though. It has some very nice and very, slightly different black and white illustrations, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's got a rather beautiful cover that the 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 English edition is going to use for the paperback. Oh, okay, cool. Well, look, th thank you one more time for um, for joining Not us. Not at this all. Was, I'm really, really sorry cool. that I dropped you out. I I feel awful. I don't know what happened. Um, uh, I think it was only for the last two minutes, and it's nothing th that you should feel responsible for. That's no, I don't I know do. what happened. <laughs> yes, exactly. Anyway, I'm glad it happened not, quite late on anyway. All right. Th thank you so much. Really, really not appreciate Not at all. It. I'll say goodbye. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Now, how do I sign up? There we are.